get ready to hear her talk. And everyone, let's welcome Miriam. Yes? Yes. Hello. <laughs> now you can hear me. Uh, thanks for coming. It's really exciting to be here in Taiwan. I also have never been here, and I'm really enjoying uh, my time here. It's really a lovely country and really nice people. <laughs> so uh, thanks for hosting us, Taiwan, at this uh, flagship event. And um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about quite a crazy <laughs> topic, which is building uh, my career in WordPress while raising seven kids. Yes, I do have seven kids. And, and I, yeah, so I'm going to tell you about that and some of my learnings along the way. So, um, but first I'll just tell you a bit about myself. Uh, so I've been in the WordPress space for over 17 years. Um, and that started when I founded my WordPress development agency uh, after I gave birth to my fourth kid. Um, when I realized I needed more flexibility in my life, and I'll get into that. Uh, after doing that for about 13 years, I co-founded and was the CEO of a startup called Stratic. If you've heard of it, it's a platform for publishing WordPress websites in a static format. Um, that came to solve issues that many of us are familiar with in the WordPress space, uh, security, scalability, and, and performance. And by publishing the sites in a static format, which means basically just HTML files and CSS and JavaScript, it's super fast, super scalable, and like you leave the servers behind. So I. Uh, founded that company to try to solve these issues, and thank God that uh, I did solve those issues with, the, with this platform. Um, and it was a venture-backed startup, so that's also part of my story, uh, meaning we raised funding from uh, VCs and investors. And in June 2022, Elementor acquired Stratic, and I've been with Elementor since then. Uh, six months into being at Elementor, I uh, took on this new role called Head of WordPress Relations, and that's what I'm doing until now. So that's a bit about me. Um, I just want to make some disclaimers about this talk. So yes, I have seven kids, but that has a lot to do with a lot of things, including my own personal choices, but also my society and my context and my culture. So. My point here is not to inspire or motivate anyone to do anything that I have done. <laughs> okay, so that is not my point. Um, it's, a, it's not, it's like a little, what? Okay, fine, anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, my point is like, we all have multiple aspects to our lives. Often part of it is our business and professional life and our personal lives. And I think whether you have zero kids or seven kids, we're all trying to figure out how to kind of juggle that and make that work for ourselves and give everything the attention that it needs and deserves. So having done the extreme version of that, I call it like an extreme sport, founding and selling to companies in the WordPress space and at the same time raising seven children, I've learned some things along the way, thankfully. And so I'm here to share that with you in case that's helpful um, in some way. Um, and I just also want to say, that if you've heard me speak at work camps in the past, you will have maybe noticed that my talks tend to be like technical and very unpersonal. So, you know, I've spoken about content security policies, woo, super personal, and uh, performance and static, um, and even the business of WordPress. I have mentioned and referenced here and there that I have seven kids, but it's always kind of a side note and usually not publicly discussed. So. This is quite personal for me, and so it is a bit of a sensitive place. I'm just putting that out there. The reason I uh, submitted this talk is because people have been saying to me for a while that I should share my story, because um, it's a weird, unique story. And so I am, but, um, but just so you know, it's, like, it's, kind of, it's kind of vulnerable for me to, to share my per like, things about my personal life. At the same time, I'm not sharing everything about my personal life. It's not, <laughs> you know, I still like my privacy, so, but, um, what I'm sharing has to do with how I, I manage uh, personal and business, and yeah, and hopefully that's helpful to you guys. Okay, so the role of WordPress in my career and my family. Um, after I gave birth to my fourth kid, I realized that I needed uh, more flexibility in my business life. At the time, I was working at an intellectual property firm, and like a few months before she was born, all three of my kids had chicken pox, but they didn't have chicken pox in any convenient way. It was one kid had it, and then another kid had it a week later, and then another kid had it a week later. 
So I kept calling my manager and being like, I can't come to the office again, I can't come to the office again. And, and he was actually like, nice and understanding, but I didn't feel good about that. I felt bad that I was not able to deliver or show up, and I didn't like being in that situation. And, you know, I was, and with a fourth kid coming along, I was like, okay, I definitely need flexibility in order to be able to be with my kids full-heartedly without feeling guilt, um, and I need to not be in like, a, an office type of job. So after my fourth was uh, born, I quit. Nicely, but I quit. And I decided to go freelance. I actually studied English literature, which is a very weird thing considering my career path, but I, I did. And uh, I started by offering content creation services to companies and organizations. But what was happening was this content was consistently going into websites. And I found that I was much more interested in how those websites worked and what opportunities they brought than writing the content. So as I was like, providing these services, I also started to teach myself WordPress. And um, why WordPress? I was exploring the options, came across the open source options, felt more connected to that, tested them out, and fell in love with WordPress. So I was teaching myself how to build WordPress sites, and then I started to offer it as a service. And I was probably one of the first in Israel to offer WordPress to businesses as a professional service. Um, at the time, companies were starting to look to set up blogs. That was like the cool thing and WordPress was a great solution, and I, I was there to do that. And, um, and eventually that turned into an agency. So I chose WordPress because I liked it, um, but it brought a lot of benefits to me in terms of my professional versus personal life. First of all, because it's, um, sorry, <laughs> because it's uh, web-based, it's super flexible, and I could do it when I want, when I want. If, I can, if I'm not available, I just won't do it, and then when I, when I am available, I'll be all in and working. And I can do it from home, and I can do it from wherever. And also, as you're working with WordPress, if you're providing it as a service, you end up having to learn a lot of things around it. Um, I joke that I started out by building WordPress sites, but I ended up becoming somewhat of a server expert, which is not what I was looking to do. But when you're working with WordPress, you just have to understand that aspect of it. And then, if you're providing it as a service, you also have to learn how to manage a business. So, you know, you learn, well, I learned, and I'm sure many of you, as you're going along, you learn marketing, sales, you know, management, and all this kind of stuff. As, and if you have an agency and it's growing, all of that, what, that comes with it. And that, to me, was really interesting. It was, um, I was like, excited about the opportunity to learn about all these different things as I went along. Um, and considering that I like, don't fit certain molds, let's say, um, being a mother of many small children, uh, coming from Israel, um, and different things like that, I, I don't fit a mold, and in many industries, that might make me stand out in not a good way. But in the WordPress community, it's very diverse and very opening, open and very welcoming. And so I call myself a weirdo, like I was a weirdo. <laughs> and I was okay. I could be a weirdo and be myself in the WordPress community um, and continue to develop and, um, and be part of it despite that. So WordPress, I fell into it, but it ended up being a wonderful enabling choice for many reasons. So how did family and business make me better? I think we often try to draw lines in the sand in terms of our personal life and our professional life. And we're like, they're not connected, they're not related, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that. And I'm not going to think about either one of them you know, at the same time. And they have no connection to each other. In my experience, that's actually not the case. I found that as I was going along, I was able to take learnings from my personal life and apply it to business, and vice versa. Um, Things that I was doing in business made me better at running my home in a more efficient way, um, and, and like personal relationship types of things where I was able to apply to business. So I, I started to feel like uh, with my kids, I'm providing them with customer service. <laughs> so as in the agency, we were working with customers and clients and providing this customer service. I found myself feeling like I was doing that with my kids, that they're like something around customers, employees, and stakeholders. That's my kids. And so, <laughs> and, um, and I would apply certain things from providing customer service to them. Okay, so I have seven kids. They all need attention. Can I give them all attention at the same time? No, because I'm just one person. So what do I do? I prioritize. Who needs attention right now? Who has the highest level of critical, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, um, and even, okay, how do you communicate with customers? You have to communicate a different way with different clients because, you know, some are more technical, some are less technical. Um, some have more background, some have less. And this, so the same with kids. Like, some you need to talk to them in a more emotional way, some in a more practical way. 
you know, some need more hugging, some need just like, here's a good bowl of pasta, you know, or whatever. So, um, so I, I often felt like I was providing customer service to my kids, and I, and I, and I think I did that better <laughs> because of work. Um, and in terms of building relationships. So, you know, there's a lot of talk in uh, the world of business, like hustle culture, which I can't stand, and I can't stand that word, so I don't even want to say it. But um, it's like, oh, got to do, got to do, we're going to keep working, 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 and then it's going to bring success. Um, what about building relationships? What does that have to do with business? Shouldn't we just keep working? So, um, in my experience, none of us are working in a bubble, and everything we do is based on a relationship with other people, whether it's our colleagues, our clients, customers, in a venture back startup, it's your investors. Um, it's all relationships, and so we want to do that well. And I, I feel like there's not a lot of discussion around that in the business world. Um, I come from a pretty big family. I have something like 30 cousins or something. <laughs> and, uh, and I myself come from a big family, um, and we're just, we talk a lot. Like, we're, it's like a lot of just gabbing. And um, my grandfather was a rabbi of a Jewish community, and my grandmother, like, co-led it with him. And so, you know, community stuff. And we all just talk a lot. And so I took that from my personal life um, people are like, oh, you're so good at talking. I'm like, well, you should have seen how I grew up. None of us stopped talking ever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's, that I was able to take and apply to my life and uh, to my business life. And um, I think, you know, if we pay more attention to that, seeing our business relationships as uh, also important and um, having the same quality and investing in that, then I think that's better for everyone uh, in our business uh, dealings. Okay, so that, that's like kind of background. Now I'm going to just share some lessons that I've learned. Never say never. So when we're young, we're sure that we know everything and we know how everything's going to be and we have very like, solid ideas and opinions about things. For example, my kid will never have a tantrum in the supermarket. Not mine. Look at that terrible parent. How can their kid have a tantrum? They don't know how to control them. And then, of course, you start to have kids and they have tantrums in the supermarket, whether you want it or not. <laughs> so <laughs> things like that like, are, that are humbling experiences. Um, another example is I always said, I'm never going to give my kids chocolate spread sandwiches for school. That's, <laughs> that's a common sandwich in Israel, and it's very easy. And I'm like, no, why would I give my kids sugar-filled sandwiches? And then, of course, I found myself giving them chocolate spread sandwiches at some point. Um, so why should we never say never? Because a few things. One is <laughs> you change and evolve. Right. So we have opinions about things, and then as we go through life, we learn things about ourselves, about the world, and we start to say, okay, actually, maybe that's not like the worst thing in the world, and maybe that actually makes sense for me. I'm not in favor of chocolate sandwiches, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, you can't control how things pan out, so you can also be like, this is how things are going to be. I, I find it somewhat amusing when people are like starting their families, and like, oh, I'm going to have like three kids, and they're going to be exactly three years apart, and there's going to be a boy and two girls. I'm like, okay, good luck with that. Because <laughs> you just can't plan a lot of things, and even how are your kids going to turn out, and what are they going to be interested in? Is one of their kids going to have a learning disability and going to need more attention? And you're like, my kids are all going to be like Harvard graduates. And then, no, they're not, because they're different, and they need different types of attention. So, um, yeah, so... Things don't always work out the way you think, and it closes you to opportunities. Um, that's something I've learned along the way. Like, if you set a line and an opportunity comes along, if you're too connected to that line, you're not going to embrace it, and that's a shame, because there's some opportunities that might seem like different than what we expected, but they're really amazing, and so it's worth being open to that. This is Exhibit A in Never Say Never. This is our dog, Casey. She joined our family in September. My oldest son, my oldest is my son, and he's 25. So basically for like 24 years, from the moment he started talking, I've been saying we will never, ever have a dog. It's not happening. Never, no way, no how. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to end up taking care of this dog. I have already seven creatures to take care of. No, thank you. I'm not doing it. Anyways, now we have a dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was my line in the sand. And it worked out in a way I didn't expect. And there's a story behind it, which I, you know, it's not that interesting, but it really worked out in a way that made, it made sense for us, I have to say, even I love her. She's very cute and uh, hilarious, actually, also. So we have a dog, so never say never. You only can control what you can control. So we can often spend a lot of time being frustrated and upset about things that happen, and often we just we can't change them. It's just circumstances, and they're, it's, out of, it's outside of our control. 
And spending effort and emotions on that is just not worth it. And so what I've learned to do is say, OK, what's going on here? This is out of my control. I can't, I can't change that. But what can I control? What can I change? What can I work to influence? And then, uh, directing all of my energy there, both in business and in personal. So that is, part of that is accepting unpredictability. So understanding, again, our plans, whatever. <laughs> like, they're good. it's good to have plans. It's good to have a direction. But just be open to the fact that just, you know, life is dynamic. People are dynamic. Things are dynamic. Um, and when you stop trying to change what you can't control, you can then focus on what actually matters. And what matters at any given time is what you can control. So what can you do? Can you give more support to someone? Um, can you help out? Can you make changes for your, to yourself that will help and things like that? Um, and letting go of guilt. Okay, so I'm a Jewish mother, which means that I should be the epitome of guilt, right? That's the stereotype. <laughs> I probably do have a lot of guilt. <laughs> but, um, but what I also have learned is that that also is draining. Um, and it's the same for business and for personal. At any given time, all of us, and I know that this is the case about all of you as well, we're all doing our best to do our best, right? None of us want to do something badly or partially or fail. But if we do, if we can't do everything that we think we should have done, there's a reason. It's because we just we couldn't at the time. The context just made it not possible or, or we just didn't, we don't have the capabilities. We don't always have the capabilities to do everything or whatever it is. And it's not worth being guilty. Instead, look at things and be like, okay, what can I change for the future? How can I do this better next time? Or if this happens again? Or it is what it is, and like it's time to move on. And um, yeah, so I know it's hard to give up on guilt, but we focus on negative things about ourselves, um, like in many ways. And instead of feeling guilty, maybe it's like I try to do this with myself, and definitely not always successful. Look at what you have achieved and what you have done well, and focus on that and try to do more of that. Timing matters. So in the hustle culture, barf, um, <laughs> people will be like, and if you work really hard and if you work all the time, then you're going to achieve everything. Okay, so first of all, that's not true. <laughs> like, it does, like, actually working hard all the time does not correlate to success necessarily. And also, if anyone attributes all of their success to themselves, then, I don't know, they're missing something. Because in the end, people's success generally has to do with a combination of working hard and timing. Um, I just heard this term called um, surf, uh, luck surface area. I don't know if you've heard this, which is this idea that if you work hard, you kind of create your luck, meaning if you keep putting yourself out there, you keep sharing your vision with other people, you keep taking steps, then that like, creates a larger luck surface area, and that has to do with timing as well. Um, but even so, and yes, we should make the mo utmost effort to, to succeed and put in, put in the effort, Timing, in the end, plays a crucial role. Two people can be working just as hard as each other. One will have better timing, the other will have worse timing. It doesn't mean that this person is more worthy or more capable or anything like that. It just means that they had better luck slash timing. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, in, yeah, timing plays a crucial role and learn how to identify these pivotal Moment. So this comes back to keeping your eyes and self open to opportunities that come along. So as you're going along, opportunities can just come out of nowhere, like and totally unexpected, and just things that you didn't even dream of. So you do your hard work, you put it in, put in the time, keep yourself open to opportunities, and with the right timing, um, good things will come along. Okay. So the power of authenticity. I talked about relationships in business, like in our personal lives, we have relationships. And they're important relationships and meaningful relationships. But they are between people. And people want to connect with people, right? It's boring and uninteresting, and it feels artificial to connect with someone who is like a, an avatar of a business person and uses jargon and, you know, doesn't have much of a personality, doesn't have a sense of humor, doesn't share things about themselves. You know, obviously you don't have to share a lot of stuff, but they're not a human being. That's not interesting, and that's not someone you necessarily want to connect with on any level, including business, um, and it doesn't generate trust. So in the beginning of my career, when I founded my agency, I was like, hmm, well, I think I'm going to be a businesswoman now, so maybe I should dress like a businesswoman, because I think that's what you're supposed to do. I should look the role, so people will take me seriously. So at some point, I tried to buy like 
businessy clothes. <laughs> and I, that did not work for me. I felt uncomfortable, I didn't feel like myself, and also with seven kids, someone is always either throwing up on you or smearing ketchup, ketchup on you or something, and having clothes that you can't just throw in the laundry. Um, by the way, and that's when I started wearing all black. <laughs> my kids look at my closet like, Ema, why is everything black? I'm like, because you all were always like spreading things on me. So, <laughs> um, so I decided that's not for me, and I need to be myself, and that includes how I dress. Obviously, we should be respectable and you know, presentable, but I decided to go with who I am, including externally. So I'm going to show you a picture. So this is me and my co-founder of Stratic, Josh Lawrence, and the guy in the middle, his name is Eric Ries. Eric Ries wrote um, a book called The Lean Startup. It's kind of considered the um, startup bible. It's a good book. So. I recommend it. And when we were working on our fundraising round, a friend introduced us to him. And uh, he's very influential. And when he heard our pitch, he was like, OK, this is amazing. I'm all in. I want to invest. And I'm also going to, going to introduce you to investors. So we, this picture was taken in San Francisco. We flew there quite a bit uh, to close our round. And I'm wearing a headscarf, as you can see. The reason I'm wearing a headscarf is because I'm a religious observant Jew, and many married Jewish women, they wear a headscarf, and so did I, and that was me. And again, at one point I had to decide, do I continue looking like that, which is like a weirdo in some ways, no offense to anyone who's wearing a headscarf, but like you don't look like everyone else, or do I find a way to do it in a more calm and acceptable way? And I was like, no, this is who I am, and people can kind of take it or leave it. And we closed a very nice funding round while I looked like that. I don't know what people in San Francisco thought. Did they think I was like a hippie? I, I don't know. Nobody asked me about it. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, why are you wearing that? But um, I, just, I just went all in with who I am. So you don't have to, obviously, you don't have to do anything I'm saying. But um, you can definitely try to fit in the mold if it feels more comfortable with you. But also, bring your true self to things. Um, in conversation, in your interests, in how you look, it's all OK. Um, I was saying to someone, uh, that, you know, we meet so many people at these work camps, it's hard to remember. I said, if someone has purple hair, I'll remember them. So that's also an advantage. I was once at a conference, it was like so packed, and someone wanted to meet me. And uh, I was like, I don't know how we're going to meet. Anyways, I see this guy come through the crowd. He's like, make way, make way. He said, Miriam, I found you because of your headscarf. I was like the only one like that. So in some ways, it can help make you more memorable um, and stand out in positive ways. Okay. Managing so much stuff takes so much time, and I am always trying to find ways to digitize and automate so that I'm not repeating things and I'm kind of helping my future self. I always am like, okay, will future Miriam be able to find this document? Will future Miriam, you know, will this be helpful to future Miriam? So on the business side, these are just some of my favorite tools. They're like little tools. Well, ChatGPT is kind of a big tool, but it's a prompt. They're little tools that um, help me do things more efficiently. So Text Expander. I put in a shortcut, it like, expands into anything. You can set it, so it can be my bio. I have short bio, long bio, like every time I apply for some, like, to talk or whatever. Our company URL, my phone number, email, like responses to things, it's just super useful and I love it. Monosnap is my favorite uh, screenshot uh, app. I've tried a lot, this is my favorite. Uh, ChatGPT, obviously. Um, Dex. Dex uh, is something I discovered recently, and I'm in love. It's, a pers it's like based on the word Rolodex. Um, it's a personal CRM. So again, I've been in the WordPress space for 17 years. I've met a lot of people. I really try to remember everyone, but I don't always remember everyone, and I also don't always remember what we talked about. And um, this just, it syncs really nicely with LinkedIn and Twitter, and I can tag people based on their interests or in, like their companies. And, it's, I use it intensively to keep track of people who I meet now so that I, I can keep track. Um, and so, just one of my favorites, Calendly, obviously, for fast scheduling. Notion, not Notion, but Notion Calendar. Notion Calendar has a really cool feature, which it adds a, a, like a little calendar to your meeting bar, to your, your bar on your Mac. And then it shows you, you can easily see what your upcoming meetings are. And also, a minute before a meeting, a link pops up directly to the, to the video call. I needed that because I kept forgetting to join meetings. <laughs> so I love that. Um, it has other cool features too, so I would check it out. On the personal level, um, these are some of the apps that I use to make myself more uh, optimized. So Google Keep for my shopping list. I'm just saying, in case you're trying to figure out. Uh, like I have my phone with me always. I'm like, oh, we need more tuna. Uh, done. It's in my shopping list. And I only do online shopping, by the way, because I'm not spending hours going to the supermarket. Nope. Um, WhatsApp, I actually have a WhatsApp group with my kids. 
<laughs> and the reason is to share nice things, but also to be more efficient with family announcements, because otherwise I have to like, get in touch with seven people, and that's not efficient. So it'll be things like, uh, the cleaner's coming today at 2 p.m., uh, or the supermarket order's coming, or we're going away for Shabbat, like for the weekend or something like that. So um, that helps me be more efficient. My calendar is key. I try to offload as much as I can from my brain so I don't have to remember things. I think my memory's not great, but also when you're trying to remember a thousand things, business and personal, it's just impossible. So the minute I have to remember something, I immediately put it in the calendar, in a reminder, something like that. So my calendar has my personal calendar with all the kids' appointments or whatever, school stuff, and then, of course, uh, business meetings. Um, Apple Notes for note-taking, but actually mainly for um, my recipes. <laughs> so cooking is very important because I've got to feed the kids, they're always hungry. And so I've become an expert at like, making big dishes that don't take a lot of time and are delicious. If you want recipe recommendations, let me know. And Dropbox, um, I love using Dropbox uh, actually for personal things because the mobile app has a great scanning capability. So like a kid gets a document, uh, like the doctor prints out a report, I'm going to lose the paper, no question. Immediately I can scan it straight into, every kid has a folder. That's me helping future me. Because um, eventually, you know, you often have to refer back, and so it's easily accessible. Embrace minimalism. So I know that there's this Netflix show called Min Minimalism or something like that. I couldn't watch it. I thought it was boring. So I don't mean like that extreme version, but like getting rid of as much clutter that is like physical and not physical from our lives. So less is more, um, just in terms of like stuff. I hate stuff. I don't like having stuff. Whenever I can, I'm like, kids, we're giving away half your closet and things like that. Um, I don't, you know, it's just, especially when the kids were growing up, we lived in a smaller apartment, we didn't have a lot of space, like, there, there was no room for anything extra, so if it wasn't touched for like a year, off it went, I have no emotional connection to things. Less clutter means more headspace for other things, it's just not, like, taking up any room in our brains. Um, say no to things, I'm still not so great at that, but um, I did learn to, st like, people would be like, oh, Miriam, can you come speak to this? These, these, these students and that, like that kind of stuff, and those students, and maybe let's do a side project together. And I'm excited about everything. I really am. But I learned to start saying no to things that I, because eventually you stop doing anything well if you're doing too much. You're not making anyone happy. So um, I try to say no, and sometimes I feel really bad about it. Um, I, you know, I mentor these uh, these women students in Jerusalem, and um, you know, at a certain point they like they bring me and they have this accelerator. And at certain points, I have to say no, and I feel bad. But, you know, you just can't. I have to, my priorities are my kids, my family, and my work. So, yeah, it's hard, but it's important. Um, and simplify. So, kind of like my cooking. Like, just do things easier. You know, you could make two types of chocolate cakes. One can have, like, three bowls. You have to whip the egg whites and I don't know what. Um, or you can just put it all in a bowl and mix it all up and, and then pour in a pan, and they're both delicious. <laughs> so it's like that in personal and business, like just try to reduce steps of things, try to make things simple, simpler for yourself. Recharge and take breaks. Hustle culture, work all the time and you'll be successful. No, you're going to burn out and you're not going to do things well. So um, it's really important to stop and give yourself that time. Um, Sorry, this is really tiny. Discover the necessity of real deep breaks to prevent, yes, okay. Okay, I'm just going to talk quickly about Shabbat. So Shabbat is our weekend, um, and I, I keep it in a particular way. So basically, every Friday night, I turn off, we all turn off all of our electronic devices. No computers, no TVs, no cell phones. Um, cook all the food before Shabbat, so I'm not cooking, and that's it. We just shut off from the world. And that, to me, helps me recharge my brain and recharge my batteries, and I, I start working again on Sunday, totally refreshed. It's like, by the end of the week, I'm, I'm exhausted. And then Sunday, I'm refreshed, and my brain is clear, and I can have, like, ideas come to be better, and I'm, like, really energized to work. Shabbat is a hard thing to keep. <laughs> I, I was telling some other people um, in the WordPress community about it, and they tried to keep it, and it's, it's, not, it's not easy. So not that, but some way to disconnect and really give yourself the time to, to recharge your batteries. It will help you work better. And it will also give you longevity. We're doing a marathon. We're not doing sprints here. And find what works for you to stay grounded and focus on what matters. Okay, so that's like that. Okay, work-life jutting act. So just like a few things to wrap up. 
Self-care, I also hate that term, so I don't really mean like, oh, I'm gonna, I don't know what, meditate and like drink tea and I don't know, uh, go to a spa or I don't know what. No, it can be small things, but like things that you can do that are, are good for you, um, it's totally legitimate. Find joy. So if you enjoy your work, you know that saying, then it's not like you're working, and that's true. So I'm fortunate that I, I love what I do, and I love the people that I work with, and I hope you all do or will find that. Um, so finding joy in your work means also figuring out what works for you, like what, where your passion lies, um, and then you can be happy every day when you're going to work. And also, outside of work, what brings you joy? Um, try to make sure that you fit that in. So for me, like uh, when I was going through hard times, in my life, sometimes it just meant going to like a cafe and getting myself like a good coffee and like a little breakfast. Even that would make me happy. So, you know, find those things. Um, yeah, we're in it for the long term. Okay, laugh. Uh, if you know me, I, I laugh a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, it's because I think things are hilarious. But um, there's a lot of opportunities to laugh. Like, so when you're raising small kids, it's exhausting. And just, you're just like, oh my gosh. And I, I, you're lucky you're so cute <laughs> otherwise. But also, kids are hilarious. One of my kids in particular, she would say the funniest things, and I was like, oh, I should write this down, and I didn't, which is a shame. But laugh, laugh with your kids, and laugh at work. I've also been fortunate to work with hilarious people. And it's like we have, it's almost like we're competing to make each other laugh more. This is at Stratic. Elementor's kind of funny. <laughs> But the strategic people are hilarious, and uh, we have some great stories. And like, if you can laugh with your colleagues, um, you just you know, you, people who laugh together success, succeed together, or something. I don't know if that's a saying, but that's what I feel like. So make sure to laugh. Okay. So my kids and my career have taught me more than I ever expected, and I wouldn't change a thing, even though it's like crazy uh, going through that. Like, really, there's years I don't remember because they were so small and it was all so crazy, and I was sleep deprived. Um, I've learned valuable lessons from the beautiful chaos. It is beautiful chaos. And you learn a lot about yourself and your capabilities when you kind of push yourself in this way of juggling parenthood and professional growth. Okay, so I'm going to tell you this story and then I'm going to wrap up. Sink full of dishes, which is kind of the story of my life. But this sink full of dishes was waiting for me after we closed our funding round. So we went to San Francisco, wrapped things up with the investors, and on our flight back to Israel, they were signing. We had Wi-Fi and we're like, oh, this one signed, that one signed, thank God, thank God, thank God. And we landed, and we had closed a really, like over $6 million funding round. And that's like, that's nice. That's something to be proud of. And we were like, yay, huh, okay. And then get home, I walk in the door, it was like night, so the kids were all sleeping, and this is what's waiting for me. So you might think, oh, you're so awesome, you closed this funding round. No, dishes don't think you're awesome, and kids just want to make sure that they have food, and like, all of this keeps you humble. So I, Got, walked into the house, and I was like, yay, and then I washed the dishes. <laughs> so um, I will always remember this sink full of dishes as showing that balance of, like, you just achieved something that's pretty awesome, but you still got to wash the dishes and do the laundry and everything. So don't we get to see your kids, right? I'm talking about them all the time, and I haven't showed you them. Yes, you do. Here they are. <laughs> so I'm in the middle, and... I have one son and six daughters, yes, and recently my son and that daughter on that side got engaged, so I'm planning two weddings, <laughs> yep, <laughs> hands full as usual in different ways, thank God. Um, so yeah, so that's my, those are my kids and they're my joy and, uh, and motivation for everything that I do and um, they're amazing, thank God. So that's it, that's my talk. <laughs> So we, I think we have time for Q&A. If you don't have questions, it's okay, but if anyone does, you can ask. How are you so amazing? Oh, so but when I was preparing this, I, said to, I, told, I told a friend I was preparing this talk, and she's like, how did you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, how did you build a career and have seven kids? I don't know. I'm actually not like, exactly sure, but I just did. So. Questions? Someone. Thank you. So I'm curious to know, like, what you do. What do you usually do during your sherbet? Sh sherbet? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so at sundown, like I said, we turn off all the electronics, and um, over Shabbat we have like two, like almost they're like feasts. So all of Friday, I don't cook during the week because I just don't have time or patience, and I don't love cooking. But Friday, I basically spend the whole day cooking special foods for Shabbat, 
And then we sit down and we say some blessings, there's some songs and whatever. It's like a, kind of like a ceremony. And then we sit and we talk for so long. It's really great in this era of digital everything because all of us, including my kids, we're all like in our phones. And then without the phones, everyone just shares everything and we, we really spend hours talking. Then most of us fall asleep on the couch. It's like part of the ritual. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the next day, um, some people go to synagogue and we have another meal like that. Uh, friends come over, you know, um, we don't drive also on Shabbat. Oh, we play a lot of board games also. Speaking of driving, with seven kids, what car did you drive? <laughs> <laughs> so I had a minivan. But then as the kids got older, they're like less around, they're less going with me. I'm not like taking all seven kids with me places. You know, they're like with friends, or they're like in school or whatever. So, um, so eventually I was able to get a five-seater. But then what I did was if we go away on vacation, once my older kids got a driver's license, I would rent a second five-seater and then one kid would drive that car, I'd drive the other car, pile all in and off we go in like a convoy <laughs> to our vacation. So that's, that's how I did it. Oh my gosh. He said, which one is my favorite? So my kids are always like, All right, I'm your favorite. I'm your favorite. So this is what I say to them. Sion, you're my favorite son. Ruth, you're my favorite oldest daughter. You know, like that. You're my favorite third. You're my favorite with the curly hair. You're my favorite youngest. They're all my favorites. <laughs> no, really, they are. They're all different. It's like apples and oranges. You can't have a favorite. Miriam, I have a question. Yes. Whenever I ask my kids if they can describe what I do, they do not know how to answer oh, yeah. at all. What do your kids say when they try to describe what your profession is? Um, so for a while, they would say that I just, like, I type a lot. <laughs> so that was something. But as they're getting older, they're kind of starting to get it. So um, something that connected me to my 14-year-old now was the fact that Taylor Swift's website is built on WordPress. Oh, yeah. So I shared that with her. And I'm like, because she's a huge Taylor Swift fan. She's, her site's on WordPress, and now I'm cooler. So that helped. Thank yeah. you, Taylor Swift. <laughs> but uh, kids really, like, every once in a while, they'll be like, Ema, so, but what do you do? And I'm like, I, but actually now it's hard. I'm like, I talk a lot. <laughs> no, I, I do stuff, and I explain to them. But, um, uh, yeah, they don't, they don't really yeah. get it. Yeah, it's just how it is. And, uh, yeah. No tips. <laughs> <laughs> no tips. No. I, I actually have a real question. For, okay. From time to time... Uh, you, you know, you meet people who they're not, maybe they're like in a transitional phase in their career and they're not really sure. And like you, I've been accepted as a bit of a weirdo in the WordPress space and I just love it. And so I'm always trying to, you know, oh, maybe you should get into WordPress, contribute to open source. Have you been tempted with your children to try to push them towards a career in WordPress or did you throw up your hands and say, oh, you just do whatever you want? <laughs> So not specifically about WordPress, but I do encourage them to do whatever they want to do, even if it's kind of weird. So like my son is currently a farmer, actually, and I'm proud of him, and he loves farming. He loves tractors. He watches his YouTube videos about tractors, right? Like, and I love that he's passionate about it, and if that's his thing, great. Um, I did bring one of my kids to WordCamp uh, in Athens this year, this past year. That was the first time I, came, I brought one of my kids. It just worked out really well. And she became a WordPress fangirl. Like, by the end of that, she was like collecting all the stickers and all the pins, and she went to all the booths, and, and she, the community was so nice and welcoming to her, so she loved it. Um, and now she is like more into it. Um, but I just really, when, you can kind of be a weirdo in Israel, anyways, like in many ways, so they can find their place. Um, but I just encourage them to do what they love. That's, I think, really important, the most important, actually. Any other questions? The one there. Hi, Miriam. Um, I'm curious, oh. you mentioned about the recipes. Are, have you considered them <laughs> open like a WordPress blog, publishing them? <laughs> no, it's a, it's, it's a good question. At one point I thought, like, maybe I should do like a cookbook, like 10-minute uh, recipes for super busy whatever people. Um, I really should share the recipes. Like, I have the best salmon recipe, for example. Just don't make any other salmon recipe. And um, for Shabbat, I make a giant pan of chocolate chip squares, um, and it's really easy. And every week, my kids are like, oh, this is the best thing ever. And it, I don't know. So, yeah, I should. I should. I mean, I'll think about it. <laughs> Hi, Miran. Uh, this is Alicia. 
Here, Where here, are you? here. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, because uh, today you would like to share about how, you, how to create your own career when you, ha you are raising seven kids. Yeah. Uh, and I think very, uh, I can, I, don't, I, I should say, uh, I feel the same way when you share the content, for example, be real, uh, enjoy uh, the minimalism, and also that's what I'm trying to do right now, but also that's also an issue that I'm encountering because I'm now doing a live, a live show in Facebook, and I also try to do something that just like you're sharing, uh, you, uh, you used to want to maybe uh, buy uh, business clothes and because you <laughs> think you have to uh, have that kind of uh, impression for other people. And so for myself, I just wondering, that's also an issue that I'm just thinking yesterday. So I think very happy that I can hear what you share your own experience. But also I'm very curious that during this the whole stage, I think you will have some moment, although you have your own uh, belief because you have your God, but when you feel very, very sad, although you have a shop up, um, how do you conquer how all the conquer difficulties? Like times? Yeah. yeah. So, so there's the, the prayer side of things, but um, aside from that, I remind myself of the other hard times I've been through. Um, there's been a lot of challenges in my life, and uh, I look back and I'm like, okay, I got through these other times, and there's no reason why I shouldn't get through this, and so I'm going to be able to do it. That's what I tell myself. So, assuming you've had hard times in the past, just look back at how you handled it, and, and remember that you did it before, and you can do it again. That's how I do it. Well, with that, time is up. <laughs> and... Before we go, this is your Aww. speaker gift. Thank you. From the organizing team. So thanks. everybody, thanks to Miriam. And thank you. See you soon.